I hope I'm going to be I'm going to try to sort of um, highlight some interesting results that that drop out of this kind of analysis and and some new perspectives on uh, some formal frameworks like fuzzy fuzzy logic and also Dempster Schaefer theory and a little bit about how they might be related to each other. So, um, so here's a little bit of uh, an outline of the talk. Um, uh, looking at it, it looks quite long, but hopefully it won't be too bad. Um, so I just want to give a sort of brief introduction about these ideas around blurred boundaries and truth gaps and probabilities. So I'll just say a little bit that, about that in a minute. And I want to introduce a very sort of gen general con uh, concept of uh, three valued um, valuations in propositional logic um, as a way of uh, modeling uh, borderline cases. So this is a very, very sort of general notion. And you can think about what kind of properties that you might want those these kind of valuations to satisfy. And in doing so, you, it turns out that you can characterize different kinds of three valued valuations. So this gives us a bit of insight into this idea of perhaps uh, modeling these uh, uh, borderline cases. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about actually ordering three valued valuations. So ordering them in terms of um, what I'm going to call semantic precision, but it's, it's a kind of vagueness ordering. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about that in a little while. And it turns out that this ordering is, is quite important in understanding relationships between different kinds of um, uh, three valued uh, valuations, like in particular clean, valuations and supervaluations, which I'll talk about uh, as well. So then, then um, I want to address this sort of probabilistic aspect and particularly talk about defining probabilities over three valued valuations of different types. In doing so, I want to get, try to give a characterization of, of a particular fuzzy logic. So the, uh, the sort of simple min max variety of fuzzy logic. Um, I want to point out some links to Dempster Schaefer theory. I want to talk about conditioning in this in this context and also link that back to some well known um, conditional operators like uh, particularly those in Dempster Schaefer theory uh, associated with Dempster's rule. And finally, I want to talk about um, this approach to vagueness in uh, forming of consensus. A, consensus opinion. So it's a slightly different perspective, but using a, a similar kind of model. And and hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit in doing so about some applications to um, AI and robotics. OK, so so here's some some sort of pictures um, associated with a, a quote from from Paula Gray, which um, uh, comes from a, a, a review of uh, a sort of edited volume of, 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 of articles on vagueness. He says, today vague predicates are standardly characterized by three main symptoms, namely as predicates that are sorority susceptible, that have borderline cases and that have blurred uh, boundaries. Um, so um, unlike, um, unlike many uh, people who talk about vagueness, or many works on vagueness, I'm not actually going to focus very much or at all really on Sorotti's paradoxes uh, this uh, this time. Um, and instead I'm going to focus particularly on these notions of borderline cases and blurred boundaries. Um, so, so but perhaps in terms of borderline cases, I'm going to think about there's going to be this idea where certain propositions uh, would be may be false or true, but in other cases, neither or, or borderline true false, if you like. So this is a sort of general notion I want to try to unpick a little bit. Um, I want to I will sort of address this idea of blurred boundaries um, using a notion of of uh, what I'm going to refer to as semantic uncertainty, uncertainty about the way uh, uh, properties are, are defined, perhaps. Uh, I mean, this is a rather controversial idea in itself, um, but I'm going to suggest that maybe this is something that we could model probabilistically, perhaps. And um, and then, of course, 
you can have both things. You can have uh, uh, borderline cases and, and blurred boundaries around all of the relevant boundary regions. Um, so unpicking the, the, the uncertainty aspect a little more, we, we might think that there is, uh, perhaps typically we're, we often think about epistemic uncertainty in the sense that you've got some well-defined properties and you're trying to identify whether a certain instance satisfies that, but you may be unsure about uh, that that particular instance. So, for example, um, you might be trying to you might be unsure about certain measurements um, relating to them. So, perhaps whether or not someone satisfies this certain properties depends on their I don't know their height or their wealth and you their income. And maybe you're you, you're uncertain about what those actually are. So you've got a kind of epistemic uncertainty. So maybe then, alternatively, you could perhaps not have that kind of uncertainty. You may be sure about what their height and their wealth on their income is, but you may be unsure about certain the definition of or the position of certain boundaries, like for example, uh, the boundary that divides uh, tall people from not tall people. And of course, you might also have both situations. You might have uncertainty about the boundaries and uncertainty about your measurements. And you might perhaps have all of those together with uh, what are implicitly borderline cases, cases which are just neither one thing or the other. OK, so we're going to try to look at some of these. I'm, I may be rather because in, in the end, I'm going to talk about probabilities defined over valuations. I may not always be explicitly clear about which of these types of uncertainty um, that I am going to be talking about, but I think in, in specific cases it will it will be clear that there is a reference, for example, to semantic uncertainty rather than some epistemic. So I'll, I'll try to point that out as I go along. Okay, so so I'm you'll forgive me if I sort of dig into a little bit of 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 notation and things just to set things up and but it's it's all pretty straightforward because all of the stuff i'm going to talk about today is going to be uh in in the context of propositional logic um so so nothing very difficult at all really in that sense so let's have some language let's call it l of of propositional logic with um n propositional variables p1 up to pn and just the connectives um and or and not um, and um, we're going to talk about the sentences of L. S of L is simply those uh, sentences which are generated recursively from the propositional variables by application of the connectives. And I might also refer to the literals of L, which of course are either just propositional variables or the negation. So we've got this set of um, sentences and then valuations um, in the traditional sense, we're not what I'm going to call tasky valuations, for one of a better word, but just classical valuations, are simply functions which, well, in the first instance, just allocate truth values to the propositional variables, which can then be extended to truth values to any sentence simply by application of standard truth tables, or if you like, these kind of standard recursive rules. So the truth value, the valuation of not theta is one minus the valuation of theta, conjunction is min, uh, disjunction is uh, max and so on. So this is just purely first uh, propositional logic sort of 101. OK, OK, so I want to, so I need that notion of, of classical valuations and I'll, and I'll come back to those in a, in a little while. But I also want to talk about a very sort of general class of, of three valued valuations that you might define on this language. So this time that they're, they're going to be uh, functions from the sentences of the language into truth values zero or half and one. And the only requirement that I'm going to set on them in this very, very sort of general case is that if the truth value of two sentences, uh, theta and phi are binary, zero and one, then the standard uh, task evaluation rules will still hold. In other words, uh, V 
phi of not theta v1 minus v of theta, you'd have min for conjunction and max for disjunction. So in the case where you've got essentially uh, Boolean sentences, the standard truth values still hold. So that that's the only restriction that I want to put for the moment. So you've got that. This is going to be our sort of general class of uh, three value valuations. And what I'm going to talk about is specific examples of that and try to motivate those or at least unpick the kind of things that you're assuming when you when you when you make certain uh, other restrictions on this. OK, so um, I'm going to give a couple of examples um, uh, two two in particular that I'm going to focus on throughout. Um, so uh, this is a this is uh, the first is, is supervaluations, which um, is a theory of, of vagueness, which. Um, uh, well, this is a sort of I think this is a very sort of basic version of kind of Fine's theory of supervaluations, but it certainly ca it, ca ca it captures some aspects of it, I think. Um, and the idea is that supervaluation is um, going to be defined by a set of Tarski valuations. Um, let's call them capital Pi. And these are these are viewed as being admissible um, precisifications. So in other words, that there, there are ways in which you can make the, the, the interpretation of the language precise. And um, so you have a set of the ones that are admissible. And for any sentence, you say that the, the truth value of that sentence is one if for every classical valuation, for every task evaluation in pi, uh, it has valuation one. It's zero if for every task evaluation, the, uh, the, the value is zero and it's a half otherwise. So in the cases where some of them are ones and some of them are zeros, it's a half. So this is a sort of um, basic type of three value valuation in this proposition of setting. And then uh, there are a couple of truth functional uh, definitions. So the first is called clean valuations. And this is uh, these are um, simply three value valuations which are defined according to these standard three value rules. So it's like essentially taking the Tarski rules and uh, generalizing them to all all truth values. OK. Um, and then another example. So, so clean and supervaluations are, are, are two particular cases that we're going to be focusing a lot on. Um, Lukasiewicz valuations are another example. I mean, I mean, there are many others as well, but the Lukasiewicz valuations is another that I want to um, that I'm mentioning because it, it turns out um, they have that they're difficult to order. So I'll come back to them in a minute, but they have the property that Again, you have this sort of dual property V not theta is one minus V of theta. The conjunction rule is max of zero and the sum of the two valuations minus one and the disjunction is min of one and the sum of the two valuations. OK. OK, right. So I want to. Um, so what I want to do now is to try to unpick a little bit some of the assumptions uh, that you make when you actually decide to choose one of these different types of three valued uh, valuations. So um, I'm going to identify a number of, of, let's call them properties, and try to use those properties to characterize um, some of the three valued valuations. So um, the first of the properties so is that your three valued valuations should, should be Dual. So V of not theta should be one minus V of theta for any any sentence theta. So that's that's a sort of very a very general uh, property, and we're going to almost always assume that. Um, P two is tautology, which says that three valued valuations should respect classical tautology. So if theta is a Tarski tautology, then uh, it it should always have a truth value one for a, for your three value valuation. And also P3 says that, and this is perhaps controversial for, for, for people who, who are interested in many value logic. So is that um, three valued valuation should also res respect classical equivalence. In other words, if you've got two classically equivalent sentences, then they should have the truth. They should have the same truth values. 
uh, in your three value model. And the fourth one is, is a related uh, property, which is called non-vacuous, which says that um, at least the sum sentence in the language for it. So for any valuation, there should be some sentence in the language which doesn't have a truth value of half. OK, so it turns out that P1, P2 and 3, P3 in a propositional setting um, completely characterize supervaluations. So in other words, um, a three valued valuation is a supervaluation if and only if it satisfies those three properties. Um, so uh, you can see that. So that and, and the interesting thing, and perhaps this is in some ways not surprising, that given that they, they have a sort of inherently classical definition, supervaluations, they're, 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 they're characterizing in a, at least strongly in part by these two properties, P2 and P3, which are also about preservation of classical properties. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a sort of way of rewriting um, theorem two as a, as a corollary where you can um, replace P2 with P4. So in fact, Supervaluations can also be characterized instead by P1, uh, P3, and P4. So duality preserving equivalence and they're being non vacuous. So it's again not particularly surprising there. Okay, so the so that's one one kind of this is that those are the kind of things that you're assuming when you, you make an assumption of, of, of supervaluations. And then um, in terms of Three valued valuations. Um, here are another four properties. Um, one of them is uh, commutative, which says that um, your your valuation should be commutative for 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 and and or. There's P six, which is bounds, which says that um, essentially it says that um, the the only way that um, so it. So it, if if so, it, it's essentially saying that the only way that your va the valuation of theta and phi can be true is if one of theta or phi is true. And it also says the only way that the disjunction can be completely false is if one of them, theta or phi, one of the disjuncts is completely false. Monotonicity is again standard monotonicity for um, the the truth. For, for, for conjunction and also for disjunction. And borderline is perhaps, the, this is the pro probably the controversial one, which ends up actually um, being important for clean valuations. And it says that if you've got um, two, uh, if, if your truth value for theta and phi is it are both a half, then the truth value for the conjunction and the disjunction should both be a half. So it's a kind of, it says, you know, Otherwise, where does your where does your non borderlineness come from? Where does your absoluteness come from? Otherwise, so it it turns out that if you take P one, which was the, your your standard duality property, v of not theta is one minus v of theta, and you add P five down to P eight, then that's a characterization of uh, clean valuations, and um, it's in, it's important to note that P8 is very critical here because it turns out that it's the only one of these uh, these properties that supervaluations don't also satisfy. So it turns out that P5, P6, and P7 are also satisfied by supervaluations. Okay, okay. So those are sort of a kind of unpicking of of. Um, of some of the assumptions you're making when you when you when you're sort of choosing between something like supervaluations or something like clean valuations. Um, now I want to talk a little bit now uh, about um, how you might order three valued valuations in terms of their what I'm going to call semantic precision, but it's it's really an ordering on their propensity to give borderline. Uh, truth values. Um, so in order to do that, it's convenient to notice that given any any three valued valuation on the language, 
um, you can naturally define um, a lower and an upper valuation in the following way. So, um, so given your three value valuation, you can say that the lower truth value of theta is one if the, the tree value valuation is true and it's zero otherwise. And the upper uh, truth value is one, providing your three valued valuation is not false. In other words, it's true or a half, a one or a half, and is zero otherwise, so zero when it is false. Um, so obviously this, this valuation is less than or equal to this one. Um, and it's convenient because it gives us a sort of, sort of natural sense of, uh, or natural definition of, 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 of ordering here, because we can say given, given um, three valued valuations, V1 and V2, we can say V1 is less precise, less semantically precise than V2, or v, uh, V1 is vaguer than V2, if you like, if and only if for any sentence, the lower valuation for V1 is less than the lower valuation for V2 and the upper valuation for V1 is bigger than the upper valuation for V2. So this is basically saying that, um, you know, once, once you have a definitive truth value for V1, then you must have the same definitive truth value for uh, V2. But V1 may otherwise allocate more borderline cases. So here's a sort of illustration of this, this um, uh, idea, this kind of ordering. So this is a, a, a silly example where you've got two propositions regarding ethyl. Um, uh, so ethyl is uh, a person who's got uh, a particular height and a particular age, which is represented by the, the, the dot on this on this diagram. And the dot doesn't actually move here. It doesn't change positions because that's the, her height for the moment and her age is, is fixed. And um, so here are different valuations um, according to sort of based on different boundaries um, for height, uh, uh, for, for the concept short and young. So for example, if we, below this height in this, in this particular valuation, um, so someone is uh, short if they're below, below this height value, and they're again young if they're below this age value. So this corner is where both of the propositions are true. And then, uh, you know, this is a borderline region for this region here is the borderline region for uh, young. So then that truth value is half and that's the false region. So each, each of these regions gives you a, a pair of truth values. So you can think of these three different diagrams as three different valuations. And what's changing here essentially is the size of these borderline regions, right? So these are just moving outwards, right? So the dot doesn't stay, that doesn't move, but the borderlines do. So in this case, um, this one, we're, we, you know, this is, uh, this is the sort of most, most imprecise, okay? And then this is a slightly more precise and this one slightly more precise than that, okay? Okay. OK, so so in, it turns out that this idea of um, semantic precision is um, going to be useful in order to understand this a, a little bit about the relationships between supervaluations and clean valuations. And in order to do that, I'm, I'm just going to explore the 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 what what semantic precision means for both of those classes of, of, of valuations. So. Um, if you've got two supervaluations, V1 and V2, on a language, and supposing they've got uh, admissible sets, pi1 and pi2, then V1 is less semantically precise than V2 if and only if pi1 is a superset um, of pi2. So in other words, you've got if, if pi1 is a broader set of admissible classical valuations than pi2. And, you know, that's that's not surprising either because, of course, the bigger the set, the more likely it is you're going to get some disagreement in truth values, so the more likely you're going to have a truth value of a half. OK, um, so that's supervaluations. Um, uh, 
clean valuations. Um, so the, what, in order to think about those, it's, it's rather nice to define um, for, any, for a particular clean valuation um, two sets of propositional variables. Um, capital P is going to be the set of propositional variables um, which are true under the three value valuation and N is those that are false. And of course, in this case, because they're three valued, it's not necessarily the case that N is equal to P complement. That is only the case with sort of classical valuations. So this is sometimes called an ortho pair representation and it, in, it, in it sort of it's used quite a lot in, in various types of three valued models. Um, so we can say that um, clean valuations V1 and V2, V1 is less semantically precise than V2. If the positive propositions for P1 is a subset of the positive propositional variable for P2 and the negative ones for, N, uh, for V1 is a subset of the negative propositions for V2 as well, OK. Um, which again is not surprising. So the smaller both P1 and N1, the, 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 the more propositions that are in neither, and these are the, the, the borderline propositions. It's also interesting that you can't really order Lukasiewicz um, valuations in, in using this notion of sem semantic precision, uh, because it turns out that there aren't there aren't any Lukasiewicz, there are no Lukasiewicz valuations for which V1 is, um, is uh, you know, uh, not, so you, except for the trivial case where they're equal to each other, there's no case where V1 is strictly less semantically precise than V2. So, so you can't really order those in, 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 in this way. Okay, right, so, um, so I want to now, now, now move to, 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 to try to directly address what's the relationship uh, between uh, Killeen valuations and super valuations. And the way I'm, I'm going to go with this is I'm going to try to argue that you can think sometimes, if you want to think about it in this way, you can think about clean valuations as a sort of uh, less precise less semantically precise approximation of supervaluations. It's just that it's not all supervaluations, it's a particular restricted class of supervaluations. And so what I want, I need to do now is to just define what that restricted class actually is. Um, so I'm going to introduce this notion of what are called um, complete bounded uh, supervaluations. And um, so, so in order to do that, I need to say, well, there's a natural ordering on um, task evaluations, so classical valuations. Um, and it's simply this. We say that one task evaluation is, is less than another, less than or equal to another, if for every propositional variable, uh, um, V1 uh, gives a value which is less than or equal to V2 for that propositional variable. Okay, so it, it, each propositional variable for the, V1 gives a lower value than V2. So that's that that's just a, an ordering that I'm going to use. Um, so once we've got that, that's a, a, a natural ordering on, uh, uh, on, uh, on task evaluations. And I can define this class then of um, complete bounded supervaluations. And in order to do that, I need to say, well, for any, if I've got a set of admissible task, task evaluations, I can, use, I can define a minimal and maximal valuation. So the minimal max of uh, valuation is for any prop propositional variable PI, I simply take the minimum value um, of VPI across all admissible valuations and for the upper then for any pi i take simply take the maximum value and then a complete bounded supervaluation is 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 one in which the the set of admissible precisifications have got the following form it's those task evaluations which are um between, based on this ordering, in other words, bigger than or equal to the lower valuation and uh, less than or equal to the upper one. So here's an example. 
he is a he is a um, uh, a set of uh, admissible valuations. Um, so this is a language with four propositional variables. Um, uh, so we've got each one of these values is the truth value. So that's truth value of P1, P2, P3, and P4, and so on. So here are two a representation of two valuations that are, we are, let's take those to be our set of persist uh, admissible precisifications. Um, if we take the minimum value, if we determine the minimum valuation of those, it's where well, you have to take the minimum value for each propositional variable. So it would give you, well, zero for the first one and for the second and one and zero. So that will be the minimum. The maximum will be taking the max, which will be this one. So in, in order to uh, to have a, a complete bounded supervaluation, you, you'd have to have precisification, which included all of the valuations which are between based on this ordering between these these two. Uh, sorry, between these upper and uh, uh, maximum and minimal ones. In that case, in this particular case, this is just those two. But in general, it might be more. So we have this class. So in fact, it turns out that there's a rather easier way to describe um, this class in which it's it's simply the the class of uh, supervaluations where um, where pi is determined or characterized by um, a conjunctive clause a consistent conjunctive clause, I should say. Um, in other words, a statement of, of which is a conjunction of just literals. Um, in other words, if we take pi to be uh, exactly those valuations where a particular conjunctive clause of this form is true, then what you end up with is complete bounded supervaluations. So they're, they're in some sense represented by conjunctive clauses. So this is a particular class of uh, supervaluations, and it's going to turn out to be um, relevant here to in the relationship between uh, clean and uh, supervaluations. So the thing I need to do uh, before I talk about that relationship, and that is to identify a particular subclass of sentences. Um, in order to do that, I um, I do the following. So supposing um, what we're going to do is we're going to define sets of, of complete sets of literals. In other words, that the A here is simply a set of, of literals where each proposition of a variable is, uh, occurs either as itself or as its negated self, but not as both. OK, so um, so if you've got, um, I don't know, three, three propositional variables, then a particular possibility for A could be P1, not P2 and P3, but it also could be not P1, P2 and not P3 and so forth. So these are possibilities. And we're going to let um, this sort of generic A be the set of all of those, those all of those of ways of, of those, those complete sets of literals. Now, for any for any such uh, set of literals, we can then think about the sentences which you can form simply by applying the connectives and and or to them. So not 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 using negation anymore, except for the in any more than the fact that some some of the literals might be negated. So we generate uh, we can generate the, the complete set of sentences. That we, we by applying and and or simply to this these the, this set of literals, and then you can let S that we're going to let S L L star the sentence of L star be the subclass of uh, any sentence that you can generate in this way for any for any type for for any set of literals of this form essentially. Okay. Um. OK, so this is this restricted class of formula. And now we can talk a little bit about this relationship between clean and supervaluations. So if we've got any uh, complete bounded supervaluation, VCVS, then there exists a unique clean valuation, VK, such that um, 
on the sentences in SL star, the two valuations agree. And otherwise, VK is uh, less semantically precise than V, than the, 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 su the complete bounded supervaluation. OK, so in that sense, it's on these sentences, they're equivalent. And here, VK, the clean valuation is less precise. So in this sense, you've got the clean, you could think of clean, I suppose, if you want to, as being a less semantically precise approximation of a supervaluation. But it has the advantage then of being uh, evaluating VK can be done in a sort of compositional or truth functional manner. OK, good. So. So that that's I've got to the sort of point now where where I've where I've talked a little bit about this this borderline issue. And now I want to talk about introducing probability, and I'm going to do that in a very simple, or possibly even simplistic way. And I'm going to introduce probabilities by saying, well, um, I'm going to suppose I've got some finite set of three valued valuations. So most of the time, this finite set will be perhaps a particular uh, class of three value va valuations or, or, or at least a subset of that. That class. So maybe we'll be talking about just clean valuations or a subset of clean valuations or maybe just super valuations or something like this. But for the minute, we're going to have some finite set of three value valuations. So we're going to let W just be a probability, a probability distribution because it's all finite and nicely well behaved uh, on, on over this, this set of valuations. So that's the, the very simplistic way that I'm going to introduce probability for a minute. So the idea is that you're unsure which of, for whatever reason, you're uncertain which of these um, three valued valuations is, is the correct one. And I mean, if we go back to, I just want to go back to, to this picture, your uncertainty could be um, due to both types of epistemic and semantic uncertainty. I mean, you, if we go back to this ethyl example, you could be unsure which of these is, you know, which, which actual allocation of truth values to P1 and P2 is correct, because you could be a bit unsure where this dot is, where ethyl's actual height and age are, or you could be unsure about where these different boundaries lie. So we're, for the minute, we haven't sort of unpicked that. We've just uh, we've just said, well, we're, we're unsure which is the, the correct three value valuation, and we're going to define a probability distribution over it. And then there's um, there's there are naturally two dual a, a pair of measures which 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 are generated in this way um, and I'm going to call them belief pairs um, and the idea is that you've got a lower uh, measure so that for any sentence theta it corresponds to the probability um, of a valuation where uh, theta is true and an upper uh, measure so that the upper measure of theta is the probability of evaluation where theta is false. So a very sort of natural kind of definition. And you see you see this kind of idea occurring lots of places, particular things, places like dempster schafer theory. Uh, uh, and we'll come back to that in a minute. OK, and I, I also oddly, you might think, um, want to define what I'm going to call, call midpoint um, uh, belief degrees and g given any belief pair I'm going to define a, a measure which is just simply the average or the midpoint of these lower and upper measures and um, uh, this I'm not sure there's a particularly natural motivation for doing that I suppose you could say well what I'm saying is that all of those cases um, one way of thinking of it would be to say, well, it, all of those cases which have got truth value are half, I'm going to sort of reallocate those uniformly to true or false in order to just get a single precise value. Um, but we'll see that these are interesting for, from in, in a moment because of their relationship to um, uh, fuzzy, fuzzy logic. Uh, OK. So um, there's a, there has been a, I guess from 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 the early days of fuzzy logic, there's this been this tension about um, 
you know, the relationship between fuzzy logic and probability. And, and often that has been rather uh, strongly felt, put it mildly. So here's a quote from sort of an early critic of fuzzy logic. Fuzziness is just probability in disguise. And I can, I can design it, so it's, it, it has an application, Ben, it's talking about fuzzy controllers. I can design a controller with probability that could do the same thing that you could do with fuzzy logic. So what I've, what I've been kind of interested in over the years is, is perhaps thinking about, is there, an, is there an actual relationship between probability and fuzzy logic that's a bit more nuanced than um, this? And, uh, and, and I think it turns out that at least in a very simple version of fuzzy logic, there is, there is a bit of a relationship. So I just need to introduce a, a, um, some terms for the moment. So, so given our language, we could, we could define something like a fuzzy truth degree over the language. Um, so this would be a measure which would be dual, but it then have the property that the measure of the conjunction is the minimum of the two measures of the conjuncts and the disjunction is the maximum. So this would be a measure which has truth values between in the interval between zero and one. OK, so real value truth values. So that this is, of course, only one very sort of I mean, and, and it's not even involving implications. So people might, you, you might just argue it's a fragment of of a fuzzy logic. But for the for the moment, I just want to consider measures like this. Now, it, it turns out that they that there are, of course, there are also probability measures that we can define directly on the sentences of the language, which says that, so this is just classical tautology. So for any classical tautology, it's got probability measure one. For any classic equivalent sentences, um, they're going to be, they're going to have equal probability. And if you've got um, two sentences where uh, a theta conjunction phi is uh, a contradiction, then you've got this additivity rule um, that the measure of the probability measure of theta or phi is the sum of the two probability measures. Now it turns out that this type of measure cannot be one of this type of measure. So fuzzy truth degrees as defined in this way are not probability measures and, and um, that that's that's sort of very clear. So that the relationship between probability and fuzzy truth degrees can't be that simple. So um, I'm going to try and find that relationship by by thinking in terms of these um, belief pairs and these midpoint measures and 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 also in terms of clean valuations. OK. OK. Um, so OK, so there's sort of two linked theorems here. And uh, so the, these these two are trying to sort of uh, summarize the relationship, I suppose, that, that, that it, it does exist uh, between uh, clean, clean, what I'm going to call clean belief pairs, where you've got uh, your belief pairs are generated by a probability distribution over clean valuations uh, and uh, these kind of fuzzy measures that I was just talking about. So supposing you've got a probability distribution W um, defined over the set of uh, clean valuations of L, um, but which is only non-zero for a particular set, let's call them V1 up to Vm of uh, clean valuations. And, um, uh, and the, that set is totally ordered by semantic precision. So linearly ordered. So in other words, let, without loss of generality, let's supposing V1 is less semantically precise than V2 and so on up to Vm. Um, then if you get your, your, your lower and upper uh, belief pair in the way that I described a minute or two ago, and then you take the midpoint measure, so the average of dope, those, those two, then in this case, um, the resulting midpoint measure is a fuzzy truth degree. In other words, it satisfies these properties, these axioms. But not only that, it's also true the other way around. Um, so for any fuzzy truth degree, for anything which is satisfying, satisfying these axioms, it also turns out that 
there is a unique sequence of clean valuations, so three valued clean valuations that are uh, uh, that are totally ordered by semantic precision, and uh, such that um, and an associated probability distribution. So there's a unique sequence and, a, and also a unique probability distribution W, uh, which is non-zero only on that sequence, um, such that if you then generate the midpoint measure, that would actually correspond to the fuzzy uh, truth degree. So in other words, given a fuzzy truth degree, you can always find a, 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 a set of um, or, or clean belief pairs, which which it corresponds to essentially. So here's a there's a kind of neat algorithm for doing that, just to illustrate it. So that's sort of second way around. So supposing you've got, supposing we've got a language, so it's just an example. Supposing you've got an example with six propositional variables, P1 up to P6. And supposing your fuzzy truth degree is um, defined on the language so that, I don't know, that your measure of P1 is, 0.2, the, the truth degree of P2 is 0.7, P3, 8, 5, uh, P4, 0.1, P5, 0.2, and P6, 0 0.3, 0 0.35. So then what you have to do is find the literals which have got measure bigger than, strictly bigger than a half, strictly bigger than 0.5. So for example, that will include P1, it will also include P2 and P3, but it will then include not P4 because not P4 will have measure 0.9 and also include not P5 and so on. Um, so this is the list of um, the, uh, the literals which have got uh, measure uh, truth degree bigger than 0.5. And um, so that's the complete set of them. And um, I've also ordered them in here. So this is in decreasing order. OK, um, so basically, um, so this is the full set of literals which have got measure um, uh, bigger than or equal to strictly bigger than 0.5, I should say. And you can divide that up into a positive um, set of propositional variables and the negative. So the, neg the negatives are ones have got negation. So this is actually defining a, a, a clean valuation. And you give that, um, so that's the first one you're going to give a probability value to, and the probability value you give to that valuation is twice its, its measure value minus one, which gives you 0.2 in this case. And then you drop the smallest one, which is 0.1. So that one is dropped. That gives you that set, which again is divided into this ortho pair representation of positive and negative sets of propositions. And then you take, um, you give that the probability of twice the difference between uh, these two values. So twice the difference between 0.65 and 0.6, which is 0.1. And then you get rid of the next one, which in this case is uh, not P6. Uh, that will give us a zit situation that gives us that clean valuation and again it's twice the difference and you keep on repeating this until you get the empty set the empty set here at the end which is where you're basically giving everything a borderline truth value so you can see if you look at this set of uh, clean valuations that you generated that they they have this sort of nested rule so all of the p's are sort of subsets and all of the n's are subsets so that means that you've got a sequence of that they're, they're, they're totally ordered by semantic precision and you've got a probability value and if you were to take this and um, generate your midpoint belief uh for, from it it would it would be equivalent to the associated fuzzy truth degree this uh, in this case. OK, so there's this kind of nice characterization of the, these very simple types of fuzzy truth degree and probabilities defined over clean logic. But it's interesting um, that you have this restriction here that about the, the this sort of um, v, the, the, the clean valuations that you're, you're defining your probabilities over as being uh, 
totally ordered by semantic precision, which, which suggests here that it's a kind of semantic uncertainty rather than epistemic uncertainty you are, where you are. In other words, that, you, that you're capturing here, because it's, it's where the boundaries are between, between these different classes. And, and really, this, it's, it, it's more than that even. It's, it's, it's a semantic precision where you're just quite not quite sure how precisely the language should be interpreted. So it's it's a it's a rather specific type of uncertainty that you're capturing here. Okay. Whoops. Right. Um, so uh, so how am I doing for time? Should I? Um, hello. Uh, yes. yes. Should, um, uh, how am I doing for time? Should I? Uh... Oh, you are you are talking now for roughly forty five minutes. Okay. Okay, so I've got a, a little bit more to say um, about uh, this. This show, uh, uh, did you want me to talk for about just how long do you want me to talk for? Up to an hour, it's it's fine. Or... Okay, okay. So I'll, I'll push on, and uh, it, it's it. I'll I'll talk a little bit more about these sort of relationships then. Okay, so um, so that's the relationship here between. Um, uh, this kind of probability distributions over three valued valuations and, and Dempster Schaefer, sorry, and, and fuzzy measures, but there's also a relationship between Dempster Schaefer and it, it's pretty clear, and I think this has been known uh, by people dating back to Giffray and also Field and so forth, that, that if you define probabilities over supervaluations in this sense, um, then what you end up with is lower up and upper measures, which are equivalent to Dempster Schaefer belief and plausibility measures. Um, so interestingly, um, uh, that gives us, we can also talk a little bit about the link between those kind of measures and these clean uh, belief pairs that we've been ju just talking to, and it, just talking about, it, it really comes from the relationship between clean and three value valuations and super valuations. And it's simply that, that again, um, if you've got a, a complete bounded super valuation belief pair, in other words, a belief pair which is generated by a probability distribution only, which is only non-zero over complete bounded super valuations, um, then there's a clean belief pair such that for any sentence in um, SL star, your restricted language, your, your, your restricted set of sentences, um, the, two, the, the two sets of measures are equivalent. And otherwise, um, your, your clean valuation is less precise. In other words, your lower, your lower measure for the clean is, is less than your lower measure for um, the complete bounded supervaluation and uh, your upper measure for the clean is bigger than it. So it's, it's, it's again, it's a kind of, you can think of your clean belief pairs as being an approximation of these, these particular kind of, um, these particular times of supervaluation models. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to say, um, so there's a couple more things I want to say. I want to say a little bit about um, conditioning, and then I want to say a little bit about um, fusing information in this context. Um, so so it, it's rather natural to think about conditioning here. So in other words, we could try to think about upper and lower conditional measures. So supposing we've got um, some knowledge of uh, the truth value of a, of a sentence phi, and we want to condition on that. So for example, we could consider those cases where we know that phi is true, um, or we consider in those cases where we know that phi is at, at least not false, and those are the ones that we're talking about. Um, so the conditioning here works in the following way. Um, so what you would do is you say, supposing I know that my, my three valued valuation should be such that um, phi is true, then that restricts me to a certain subset of valuations, so I should condition my probability distribution W on that subset and then generate lower and upper measures, new, new conditional lower and upper measures. And if I do that, 
for clean valuations, then I have the following situation that the lower, the conditional lower measure of theta given um, that theta is true is simply the lower measure of the conjunction of theta and phi divided by the lower measure of phi. And the upper measure is this expression, um, the upper measure of theta or not phi minus the upper measure of not phi divided by one minus the upper measure of not phi. And um, uh, this, these uh, actually look rather familiar um, in terms of uh, uh, beliefs and plausibilities, and we'll, 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 we'll see, see that in a minute. Um, OK, so um, but this is what you get for clean and you also can get things the other way around. Um, so if you if you condition here for. Uh, um, so if you condition here for. Uh, uh, given um, that phi is n at least not false, then you get these sort of expressions. So this time the upper measure has the kind of rather natural exp uh, uh, expression. Uh, and uh, yeah, so um, in general, uh, okay. So I, I, I'm yeah. So in general, in terms of supervaluation belief pairs, you get almost identical expressions for when theta is true or gent identical relationships. But when you're when condition given it's not false, then you get less. Uh, you get less um, desirable looking. You you only get bounds. For the lower case, okay. Sorry, bounds for the upper case. Okay. All right. So I want to say a little bit about. Um, I want to say a little bit now about just um, uh, using these models as a, as a model of consensus. So I've been interested in 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 looking at how in in AI um, systems of, for example, robots can reach an agreement. And when they have sort of different when they have different opinions about the state of the world. And one of the ways of doing this is using these kind of notions of borderline cases. Um, uh, so he, here's a sort of diagram that illustrates a, a, a kind of meeting in the middle. So if you if you've got two people who, who can't agree whether Eshel is short, so one says not and the other says um, yes, then maybe they could agree that she's sort of borderline, not short, not borderline short, not short. Um, on the other hand, maybe when one of them only has a weak opinion and one of them has a strong opinion, so maybe this this chap thinks maybe it's a borderline case and this one thinks definitely short, well maybe the compromise then is to take uh, the strong opinion. So this is a one particular way that you could try and adapt these notions of borderline cases to to this situation to, to 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 sort of helping to reach consensus. And uh, so this is a, a consensus operator, which is so I've been looking particularly at clean valuations in this in this context. So if you've got two valuations for uh, um, and this is for a showing their truth values for a particular proposition, maybe they should combine them in this way. So if they if they both if one of them thinks it's false and the other think it's true, it goes to a half. If they both agree it's false, then it should stay false. If if one of them thinks false and the other one thinks it's half, the stronger opinion dominates and similarly for true. OK. Um, so if you another way of writing this across all propositions is that if you if you take this the ortho pair representation, then if you take um, the. Then the combination will be to take the union of the two positive sets and take out the um, the the union of the negative sets and the other way around for. OK. So, um, so this is a sort of basic operator for combining and reaching consensus in uh, in uh, in clean for clean valuations, and you can also think about doing that for clean belief pairs. Uh, so the idea would be that you, um, so the idea would be that 
you say, well, supposing I have two probability distributions over clean belief pairs, what I should do is I should let's just, let's just suppose they're 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 independent. The, the two agents have got independent opinions who hold those, and then we're going to combine a new one by saying, well, my 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 combined belief, my combined probability of of evaluation V would be the sum over all pairs of valuations V1 and V2, which combine together give me V um, of the corresponding product of the probabilities V1 and V2. So this is a sort of a uh, very sort of standard approach dealing with independent sources of evidence. And um, again, so there's a sort of truth table representation of it here in terms of these upper and lower measures, and this is for a particular proposition. So uh, the, 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 it, the, the probability for, for, let's say, agent one that the, the, the proposition is true is, un, is underlying is the lower measure. Uh, the probability that it's a half is the difference between the lower and upper measures and one minus the upper measure is the probability that it's false. So then you can do the same for the for the other agent and then you generate the this is simply the truth operator being applied, the one we just saw, and then we're just taking the product of these different values here. So this will give you an operator. So, um, OK, so it's interesting that um, you can get a rather a nice expression for this if you just restrict yourselves to literals. And then you get an expression which looks a bit like this. So what what we've done is we've done uh, a some some experiments with this um, using both multi-agent systems, so multi-agent simulation, and and also some robotic systems. And the idea is that agents will interact. Or that there will be a population of agents, and they'll interact at random, and um, they'll combine their beliefs. And what we want to see is whether you end up with consensus and what is the nature of that kind of agreement if you do that. Um, so we need a couple of measures um, uh, in order to sort of uh, quantify our results a bit. So there's a measure of consistency, uh, inconsistency here, which we say two, three, two clean valuations, the degree to which they're inconsistent is simply the, the proportion of propositions where they have completely inconsistent truth values, either one's one and the other zero or vice versa. Uh, and vagueness is simply the degree of, um, for a particular uh, clean valuation is simply the proportion that gives you truth value, uh, uh, that has truth value a half. Okay, so um, so here, here's a bit of details about the simulation. We ran it with 100 agents, 50,000 iterations. We looked at different language sizes here, 5, 10, 50, 100 propositions. Um, and we had randomized initial opinions. So uh, initial opinions in this case are just, opinions in this case are just represented by clean valuations. We haven't added the uncertainty yet. I'll come on to that. And you get, you get something like uh, these kind of curves. So uh, there's a threshold here which says um, that uh, two agents will only combine their belief if their inconsistency is less than some threshold value. So, um, you know, if that threshold value is one, they'll always combine it. Otherwise, if it has to be zero, they'll hardly ever combine their belief. So, it's, so that's what that threshold. And this is, these are results at, after 50,000 iterations. Um, and basically, one of the things that you notice is uh, that both of these, all of these curves are going downwards. So, but but if you look at a reasonable threshold values and um, what we're looking at here, so around these values here is um, so you're looking at the number of distinct valuations. So for sort of threshold values uh, over at, le at least over 0.3, then um, you're getting basically you're getting agreement, you're getting consensus. The number of distinct valuations in uh, the population is is decreasing. So people are, are the population is is homing in on one one opinion, but also it's interesting that the average vagueness of that opinion is de is also decreased to zero. So that opinion is is t tending to be precise. So even though they, they they have this framework of of borderline cases and imprecise opinions, this this operation drives them towards uh, agreement, but also precision. Um, interestingly, we ran something similar like this. This is just more, more mere, merely entertainment, really. This is we ran this on some uh, on a robot swarm, 
So these are little kilobots and they have different colored lights indicating whether they believe a proposition is true, false or borderline. So false is red, true is uh, blue and green is borderline. So occasionally, so they're interacting with each other, wandering around, bumping into each Jonathan, other. Jonathan, I'm not yep. sure we are seeing the video, if you are showing the video. Oh, OK, it's not showing, OK. okay. Um, well, not too much, not, not too much. Doesn't matter too much. Not sure why it didn't show, but uh, I think you should uh, go on share again and share the the whole screen. I guess. Okay, let me see if I can run it again and then. Is it not? It's, it still 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 says it's sh sharing. So, um, well, I tell you what. Let, let's not worry too much about the video because uh, it's really it 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 doesn't matter too much. Um, so let me let me also say a little bit about we we also did some similar experiments uh, on this kind of multi-agent setting, um, uh, looking at the case where you had uncertain beliefs as well. So you, instead of just three valued valuations, they had these belief pairs, and we also did you know unique beliefs and average vagueness, and you saw a similar sort of pattern. But we also looked at entropy. So basically, we have a reduction in in so people converge agents were converging on a single opinion the single opinion is precise in the sense that um, it ended up being a probability distribution over precise valuations over task evaluations but not only that the entropy also decreased to zero so it ended up to be that you ended up in a situation of, of certainty so you you eliminate you get consensus you eliminate vagueness and you also eliminate uncertainty in the end of, of, of these kind of processes. OK, um, so this is just a summary of the kind of things that I've I've talked about. Um, introduced this idea of uh, three valued valuations as a way of modeling uh, borderline cases. Um, we've in, we then combine that with, with, with probabilities to get lower and upper measures. Look to the relationship between this kind of thing and fuzzy truth degrees and Dempster Schaefer. And we've also looked at uh, how what kind of role this can play in consensus. OK, so I will I'll stop there. And. And stop. There. Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so we can go for if there are any questions. Uh, you should activate the, the microphone for uh, for asking questions because we cannot allow directly writing in the chat. Any questions? Uh, maybe I have a, a question. It's more about the uh, last bit of, of the talk. Uh, I was wondering whether you have considered uh, in the simulation the possibility of getting the agents to reduce this um, bounded confidence at each iteration they get. Uh, yeah. It's a good question. Um, uh, I, I, I think we did play with it. It's been a while ago. I mean, I, I think um, it's a really good question. So you might. So were you thinking that you would re just reduce it with it would just reduce automatically with time or it would be somehow I, dependent on. I would say more with the number of iterations uh, yeah. in which they encounter other agents with a distant. Uh, uh, opinion. But given that, then my question is, is there a way to import that back into the semantics or, or how do you how do you deal with those cases? Do you have uh, ma ma some sort of can you can you define some sort of function um, maximization function which slowly changes the behavior of the operators uh, in, in, in a number of different circumstances? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the, the the honest answer is I don't know the answer to it. However, I have I have suspicions that there is a sort of general uh, property that you might want to that it, a general way in which you want might want to do it. So I, I I mean I've become kind of interested in these these sort of area of um, opinion formation and sort of collective learning in in sort of broader contexts. Um, in the last couple of years, and I've been doing, uh, I've in a slightly sort of tangential way, I've looked at uh, 
agents that um, have a model of dependencies between other agents. So in other words, they, they try to figure out how dependent their beliefs are likely to be between each other. Um, and I've tried to, to try to understand how that, so th there's an operator then, then that depends on their model of dependency and that, that you would expect to, to adapt. Um, it, it's hard to get it, to, it's hard to know exactly how it should adapt. Um, so one, I mean, I, I, I'm sure you could sort of, you could come up with with interesting ways of, or interesting um, formal models of, of such an adaptation. But what, what's difficult to, is to get it to, to do something interesting at the kind of macro level. In, in other words, it, it, the level of the population so that the actual population converges to something um, you know that that you, you you that you sort of significantly change the the, the convergence behavior. Um, um, so what 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 I do think is quite interesting with these models, and which I haven't really shown here, is um, that all of these simulations are just without any kind of evidence. There are a bunch of agents who've got opinions who then just combine them. But if you allow the agents also to receive evidence from somewhere, some source, in other words, they get some kind of direct evidence occasionally, then it, that's also quite in interesting to incorporate into to these models um, and and look at performance then. And, and, and again, they, they perform reason, reasonably well. But the, I think there is something disturbing about the fact that they all end up with absolute certainty and and no vagueness actually because um i mean i suppose you could say it's the sort of it could be you know we we end up with this kind of group think scenario where people end up with being absolutely certain about the same opinion um and but but, but it's not very good for you know from an ai perspective if 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 you're learning in an environment that's changing so, for example, if you're trying to learn about the world and then you you end up a whole population of these agents end up being completely certain and then the world changes, then it's often difficult for them to adapt to that change. So I'm not sure. I, I think it's a little bit disturbing that these, the, the, you know, these models end up with absolute certainty and absolute and absolute uh, crispness, as it were. Yeah, right. Um, I have a short follow up. Um, yeah. Something I didn't understand is a consensus always on the same value. I mean, do they always reach the same output? No. Um, OK, so it, it, in the question where this um, no. Uh, so uh, it will be random. So if you, so basically. Um, uh, da, 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 doesn't it doesn't say here so each you can see on the on the, this this particular for example on this graph there's a bunch of error bars right so those error bars is uh, are simply that you run each simulation a uh, hundred times and um with with the you know with the same setting you know the same language size the same number of agents the same the same threshold and um each one of those 100 times, it, they reach consensus on, on a particular valuation, but that, that valuation will be a different one each one of the times. So it, in, in the case that there's no evidence, it will just be random what they, they end up believing, right? Um, right? On the other hand, if you provide evidence and that evidence is consistent across the runs, so in other words, there is some true state of the world, which they're providing evidence, then 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 it may well be the case that they're they're all convert they all that they, they they repeatedly converge on the same thing, but without evidence, no, they just randomly converge on different different beliefs. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I, I would ask um, a question about the. Um, so, you, what you have is a generalization of truth degrees in terms of sequences of uh, three valued uh, evaluations, right? Yes. And, uh, but what you are characterizing is evaluation that behaves like the Zade evaluation. What yes. about 
Uh, how do you see it about generalizing this kind of result to other? Really, really results? hard. I haven't been able to. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I, uh, uh, I wondered if. Right, so. I thought I, I, I guess I thought that the particular min max calculus is, is coming from this total ordering. Um, I wondered if if you could have different kinds of assumptions that would give you different kinds of I mean, I wondered, well, so there are two questions whether different kinds of assumptions about the probability over clean valuations would give you different fuzzy measures, you know, or with different T norms and co norms or, or whether you just you, you'd need a whole different class of three valued valuations or, or, or what. But the honest answer is I don't know how to generalize it or if indeed you can. So maybe maybe you can't always. Or, um, but that, that's a very good question and I don't know is the answer. I, yeah, my, my feeling is it, it might be just a it's this particular combination of clean and 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 the ordering. Um, maybe it's not so easily extendable. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. So, are there any other questions? Okay. If not, we thank uh, Professor Lori again. Thanks for the very nice talk. Yeah, thank you Thanks, very much. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Hope to see you next time in Milan. <laughs> yes, hopefully <laughs> next time in presence. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> One day it will be nice. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for the invitation again. And uh, thanks for listening. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank, thank you to everybody for coming. And thank everybody for attending. Yes. yes. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.